Good evening and welcome to you, to all of you, to this uh, presentation by Dr. Vic Klamoski. It's truly a pleasure uh, to introduce him. I, I think uh, I, can, I can say uh, just kind of uh, having known Vic a long time, <laughs> my life and his, I think, on this campus are about in the same sector, that, that I, can, I can think of his, his uh, kind of scholarly and teaching life in about three parts. The first part being here at St. John's, uh, the next part being uh, at St. Paul Seminary, and the third part being back here. The first part came from Green Bay, Diocese of Green Bay. Are you a Packer fan? Yeah. Actually, okay. I just I was wondering if you had retained that. Okay, it's great, awesome. Kieran Nolan would say that Vic is one of the people who always made him look good. Uh, Vic then joined the faculty uh, of St. Paul Seminary, and he worked for many years there as Dean of Students. It was also a rich time for him in terms of education, because I believe it's at that time that you earned your doctorate in, in, uh, in education and, and leadership. Um, and it was also just being in the middle of a big archdiocese uh, and, and that whole web of relationships that's possible there. He returned to St. John's to direct our adult faith formation programs. I think you, you just need to know that he is nationally known for his work in facilitating complicated conversations in complicated groups. Um, he has, in fact, won and been recognized by the National Catholic Education Association for his work in leadership. He's also won the Ezekiel Award from the SOT. For many years, he has directed the Conversatio program here at St. John's, which focuses on creating and improving leadership relationships between pastors and lay leaders. Vic has also been a key member of a team working with pastors in the St. Cloud Diocese project, along with uh, Barb Sutton and I think Terry Barrero, called um, Leading Complex Parishes. This is a new program developed at the SOT. He's also been heavily involved with the Lay Ecclesial Ministry Project. Finally, currently, Vic, along with other leaders in the School of Theology, has written a grant proposal to study the issue of debt for lay ministers. Beautifully written proposal. I read it last week, um, and it's already been funded by the Lilly Foundation. His career as a lay leader a teacher, a scholar, a theologian has spanned that years from coming out of the Second Vatican Council up to the present. So he has been at every sim single stage along the way part of the reflection and practice, uh, uh, of theological reflection as well as the practice for lay leaders who want to give their lives in service to the church. The title of the presentation is Come of Age Adult Catholics after the Council. Please give Vic Klamowski a warm College of the World. Thank you for coming out tonight. There's a snow warning out, and so I'm assuming that's why we don't need life safety services for crowd control. Uh, it's a Sunday night. I just, you know, I, I, I never thought of that as I was, when I said yes to this invitation that it's a, a Sunday night. People going out on a Sunday night uh, are noble people indeed, so I thank you for being here. Um, I, start, I was a high school freshman. I started for high school freshman in 1959, and that's not only significant to give you an idea of, of the generation I'm with, but it was also when I began my seminary formation. I, was a, I went to a minor seminary for, uh, for six years and then came here to St. John's for another um, uh, three years, so I am well formed in, uh, in seminary life. And it was in the fall of 1959 that uh, the announcement that the council, uh, of, of the council was going to happen. And of course, you're 14 years old, you have no notion what that means. But up to that point, I was clearly a product of the pre-Vatican II church. Uh, I was very happy with the pre-Vatican II church. Um, uh, but, you know, from, the, from age 14 on, uh, up through my uh, time here in St. John's in college and in uh, the School of Theology, I sort of was raised 
um, as the council went on and then as the council, the work of the council began to take, uh, to take shape. So uh, what I'm going to do tonight, I was telling, just telling Abbott John before I got, I, I, did, I, I, I took this assignment because I respect him so much and cannot say no to him. I should not probably ever tell him that, but I couldn't say no to him. And I didn't, you know, I was reading and I was trying to think about a variety of things. And then I realized that I had this much stuff and I had a very small period of time to do it and that I was not capable, smart enough uh, or entertaining enough to be able to do that. And I started to panic. And then I began to realize that it was a rare opportunity for me to sort of step back from the sort of the presumed um, uh, experience of this change, the seismic change that happened in the church, to think about what my impressions are and what my perspective would be. So to kind of give you an end, the point towards which I'm moving, uh, my, my guiding claim is that um, one of the convictions emerging from the council is that the mission of the gospel to transform the world will not happen without the full conscious active participation of the laity. Now that's not necessarily a new, uh, a new uh, teaching, as, you, as we all know. Uh, all councils are part of a developmental process of thought, um, and each each success, each generation builds on the work of the preceding generation. But in this instance, at least again, as I go back into the uh, into the into the documents and then uh, use that to look at my experience. Um, this was uh, a, you know, an absolute non-negotiable reality. That if the gospel was to have its transforming effect, uh, it was going to be because the laity were engaged in new dramatic ways. So that's influenced the, the, uh, the, the, the title of my talk and the direction I finally came down uh, uh, to do and to try to bring all this together. This coming of age for me means the responsibility to know, think, and act in light of a, di of a divinely given calling. It is what we assume about adults in, in terms of being able to take their place in the world. It's to know and think and act in light of a divinely given calling. And I think in that way, Vatican Council, uh, with its teachings and then subsequent development of those teachings, put to rest that caricature that the, uh, the ca that lay Catholics were called upon to pray, uh, pay, and obey. It was always a caricature that wasn't actually uh, wasn't actually in the rule book. But when when you look at the the two primary documents that have guided me in this, uh, that simply is is uh, a caricature. Has, and has no valid standing. At the same time, as convicted as I am about this, I think that the promise of the council and its, its a sense of, of, of laity uh, is still unfulfilled uh, in the way that I would like it. So let me just tell you, add a little bit in terms of my perspective. My training is in theology here and then in adult um, education and development at the University of Minnesota. So I am a specialist in how people learn. I'm fascinated by that. I work with a large, wide range of groups, both within the church and outside of the, of the church. And um, it has been part of my life's work to pay attention to how adults learn. Um, I have a 30-year career in theological education. Um, worked 17 years with seminarians, and then I'm, uh, uh, I'm back home, and for the last 14 years I've been working in ongoing formation with lay quasial ministers and with clergy. And in the, those 30 years, I've also been a consultant in parishes. I've worked with a variety of parishes, primarily in the archdiocese and elsewhere, and was, uh, as he liked to say, his personal pastoral associate to a friend of mine who's a pastor in five assi assignments. With each assignment, he would call me up and tell us that we had received an appointment. The delight of that was spending the first two years of each of his pastorates um, helping him to, to, first of all, learn what was going on in the parish, and then to think through with him and with his leadership um, how they were going to become a parish in the fullest sense of that. So that's, that's part of my experience, is, is of working with, with parishioners, listening to them, listening to councils. And then the, the tutoring that I learned from working with lay ecclesial ministers and clergy. 
they, I mean, almost everything I know and everything I say, I've learned from them, and I don't give them adequate footnote or footnotes for that. But, you know, part of being observant is listening to what people who are on the front lines of ministry are encountering um, and trying to figure out what that all means. Because I have this long career in theological education, seminary formation, both as a receptor of it and a giver of it, I would consider myself an ecclesiastical insider. I'm not a typical adult Catholic. I've been on the other side far too long. I have a theory of the two-class system, and it's not clergy and lay, it's clergy, religious, lay ecclesial ministers, and, and others, and then there are, uh, 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 we would call them the regular ordinary Catholics. But I'm an I'm a ecclesiastical insider, and I always have to realize that I've had both the benefit and the limitations that comes with being an insider to the system. Um, on the sheet, there are a number of documents that I looked at. The primary ones that have really been most helpful for me have been the decree on the laity from the council itself, and then what I think is, is um, just a wonderful elaboration and development of that, the synodal letter from uh, the Synod on the Laity from 1988, Pope John Paul's letter on uh, the Christian faithful. Uh, it's a, you can almost start with that because it, what it really does is it takes the, I think, the vision of the decree and it uh, digs down, it goes down deep into it. So that's, that has been uh, really important to me. And of the, on that list, the book that has been the most, was the most enjoyable and that I didn't think I would like is Vatican II, This Universal Call to, to Holiness, because it's a set of essays, you know, and sometimes in a set of essays, one is really good and the others are camp followers. Uh, and this one, they're almost universally really interesting, um, insightful, and pretty hopeful. At my age, you know, there's a brittleness to me, a cynicism. You know, I've seen it all. You know, what's going to happen? What's on the horizon? And what I found myself as I read this, I wouldn't say my heart soared like a young man again, but, I, you know, it, it, the, the people writing these essays um, have immer are immersed in the life of the church, and they speak with love and hope and conviction um, about the vision of the council, not as a relic of the past or some imagined golden age of, Progressive, progressivism, but again as a compelling, living, theological understanding of who we are and who we are called to be. So that's, that's, how, that's, how, that's what has influenced me and what I'm going to say henceforth from here. Uh, the, council, uh, the, the Second Vatican Council was, as a number of people have, have said, you know, there's a lot of writing being done on, on the council now in this 50th year. Uh, it was fundamentally a pastoral council. Pastoral council in the sense that it was a vigorous, bold, courageous effort to think anew about the tradition and how the tradition continues to speak um, pastorally to, a con to the contemporary age. We know that context is everything, and so that speaking to, the contem to a contemporary, contemporary age was not sort of an abstract, yes, we must uh, deal with the, with the modern world, but was to think about a world that was changing rapidly, was changing da daily. It was going to happen with or without the council, and it's in one of those instances in which uh, there were, there were, we were ahead of, the church decided to be ahead of the crowd. Uh, obviously a decline in religious culture, a uh, competition of a variety of voices um, uh, trying to interpret what the meaning of life is. The, the, the context issue, it seems to me, is not insignificant because I do think, I do believe, truly, the more, now that I have gone back at the documents and I think about what I have observed over the years is that it truly was an act of courage. And it's an act of, I want to read this, it's a little extended paragraph from A Church in the Modern World, but I think it, it, it captures the complexity of the context of what the, the bishops gather trying to think about how to preach this word and how it was going to be heard and received was within this context. So just uh, listen. In no other age has humanity enjoyed such an abundance of wealth, resources, and economic well-being. And yet a huge portion of the people of the world is plagued by hunger and extreme need, while countless numbers are totally illiterate. At no time have people had such a keen sense of freedom only to be faced by new forms of social and psychological slavery. 
The world is keenly aware of its unity and, uh, and of mutual interdependence and in essential solidarity, but at the same time it is split into bitterly opposing camps. We have not yet seen the last of bitter political, social, and economic hostility and racial and ideological antagonism, nor are we free from the specter of a war of total destruction. If there is a growing exchange of ideas, there is still widespread disagreement in competing ideologies about the meaning of the words which express our key concepts. There is, lastly, a painstaking search for a better material world without a parallel spiritual advancement. That's a mandate uh, for a very brave, courageous group of people, because that, that is the context, that is the culture, and there is something terribly relevant about it as you hear that again. It is not changed. It is not changed. And so this idea that if, in fact, the gospel was going to enter into that chaos, it was going to be because of lay, lay Catholics who have been called into, the, into their rightful and their responsible ministry. Um, that, that was the direction it was going to happen. So when, when, when faced with this situation, it seems to me, and, and people have written about this, that there were two choices before the church and its leadership. One was, this, uh, was a defensive, take a defensive approach, that sort of withdrawal. Throw up the barricades, you know, talk about the golden crown we are all seeking, and just wait for the end to come. But the other was this pastoral notion that somehow the gospel continues to be light and wisdom in an age of rapid, radical, and often chaotic social change. And so that, that to me, you know, once I heard someone recently, a, a person even more bitter than me, talked about this the, the sort of the liberal um, council. And I think that's, that's just a, it's not a very good description at all. I think pastoral counsel. It is a counsel that said, here's a situation we have, and the gospel can speak to it with a boldness t today as though it was being preached on the, on the banks of the River Jordan. So there are three parts. The introduction must take about two minutes, and so as, we, as you can see, with age comes a need to use more words than one needs to do. So I'm going to, uh, uh, I want to talk just a little bit about what, what I see in, both in the documents and some of my observations is sort of this theological framework for thinking about the laity. And then I want to talk about these uh, five distinguishing characteristics of adult, of adult Catholics. It's the, sort of the translation of that, and that comes uh, uh, from, benef from the work that we have done here at the School of Theology in conversatio. And then I want to talk about some of the implications, because we do fa face challenges. And then there's something wonderful, and I love getting caught up in my own rhetoric about coming of age and adults accepting their vocation and their mission to transform the world, um, but there are consequences for that. And they're not, they're not gentle con consequences, they're not game stoppers, but they are ones that we continue to struggle for struggle with. So uh, I'd like just to, to end by looking at that and, and uh, uh, hoping that, that what I do in the front end uh, makes sense as we look at those challenges. So there's theological pivot points. Well, the first is a very obvious is this idea that, that baptism is the primary s sacrament, that, that it is the equalizer within the church. Uh, those who think that the Vatican Council somehow set aside the hierarchical structure and you know, the, the uh, understanding of how governance would occur have not read the do documents in their fullness. But, and I think this is one of the striking points, is that baptism is the common sacrament. It is the, sa it is the premier sacrament for all life in the church. The Pope is not more baptized than my grandson Joseph. And so that means there is a new relationship out of baptism. It is not a condition for being a Christian. It is the commitment. It is the signal, the sign of the commitment that somehow we are entering into a new reality. The second is the, 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 side, the idea of the people of God, in which for me points to this, this, this re-emphasis on our identity as one community that there is, of course, diversity in this community in terms of roles, functions, and authority. Uh, but it exists to serve the mission, not for, not for the sake of governance. 
Governance is a necessity, it's not the end. And uh, it is the, this, this idea of the people of God, of community, talks all about the quality of the relationships that are to exist within the church. What you'll see in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 about somehow we are called to interact, to be bonded together in a different way. Or uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians in, in the hymn of love, which you know, uh, probably it's self-serving, but as we try to think about what excellence meant, means in pastoral excellence, which was the grant that we got from Lily 10 years ago, uh, it came down to this notion that the qualities, uh, the quality of relationship within the church is to be extraordinary. And the only language to describe that extraordinary character is the language you find in 1 Corinthians on, on love. And then the fourth this mention is this call to discipleship, that the mission of the gospel to proclaim Christ for the transformation of the world is not the responsibility of the clergy or the religious or now lay ecclesial ministers, but of every Christian. Living as a disciple of Christ is a direct non-negotiable consequence of baptism. And then finally, uh, formed in a vision of God's action across time and grounded in a way of virtuous living, the church does not flee the world but engages it. So there's this, this change in the stance toward the world. It is, a, it is a stance that is not accommodationist, that somehow we're stuck with this, we're losing our influence, so we've got to scramble to find a way to, to language um, how we still are relevant in this world. But when, I, when you read... Uh, the Church in the Modern World, which I think probably is my favorite, my favorite text, there is a fearlessness, a courage that doesn't compromise what the church believes about any of its core values, core ideals, but a realization that somehow entering into the, dial the, entering into the dialogue with the world is not giving over to the world a victory, but of listening with a compassionate heart so that the word of Christ can be spoken with uh, greater fluency. So this stance, this stance, this new attitude towards the world has particular significance for the laity. I, I want to read this quote from uh, Christe Fidelis Laici, the uh, apostolic letter um, from the Synod of the Laity. Thus for the lay faithful, to be present and active in the world is not only an anthropological and sociological reality, but in a specific way, a theological and ecclesiological reality as well. In fact, in their situation in the world, God manifests his plan and communicates to them their particular vocation of seeking the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and by ordering them according to the plan of God. So cumulatively, that, this, particular, this framework, I think, with these theological concepts that I've obviously very, uh, very skimmed over the top of them, is that what the world needs, what the world uh, will become, how humanity will live together, is directly dependent on the laity. Not be necessarily because we're special, uh, because, because we, are the, we are the dominant, uh, we are the dominant group. I was trying to think of an image of this, and it seems to me that we could take all the clergy, lay, lay, uh, lay quasi ministers, and religious, and put them in Rhode Island, and the laity would, would fill the rest of the United States, spill over into Mexico, into Canada. And so when we talk about, you know, animating the world with the message of the gospel, we have got this huge body, um, and that these are the people who are in our schools, who run our governments, who are, run our businesses and corporations, who are in the military, our nonprofits, who are in the neighborhoods, and of course, uh, the church relies on us, on the laity, uh, to in fact be witnesses to Christ in a direct way. So, if you, if you have not re ever read the, this um, Christe Fidelis Laici, you must read it, I believe, if you really want to understand what the theology of the laity is about. But there, there's also a need to translate it, because there, uh, you know, it's, 80 some, it's about 80 pages long online, and um, uh, it, go, it, it, it is rich, and it is robust, and it is extensive. So what I think the challenge was, and where I, my sticking point in preparation was, um, how, do you, how do you anchor that? How do you get practical 
How do you say to people, when we talk about being an, a, a person of an adult faith, what are its, uh, its foundational points? And as I was stewing about this, my, car, my uh, colleague Barbara Sutton said, you know, we've been working on this for the last six years. <laughs> you might want to look at that material. And um, of course it did, because this, we have been working on um, what's called pastoral excellence. What does it mean to be an, extra, an excellent pastoral minister, priest or lay ecclesial minister? What does it mean to be an excellent parish? And we've had to try to figure out both you know, uh, as, our, as, as a result of, of our own reading of the signs of the time, as well as the, the church's teaching what that might be. And these five, um, these five markers have emerged over time, and we now use them in a pretty regular basis with uh, uh, a retreat called the Excellent Parish Retreat. But as I th thought about, okay, if, I were to, if someone were to say to me, what do I need to pay attention to in my life if I'm going to develop and continue to develop over my lifetime what it means to be a, an adult uh, 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 Catholic, I, th I would turn to these. And I think that they, they probably are not, do not exhaust it, but they certainly are, um, are indispensable to that understanding. When I typed them out on this little outline, I realized that they, and then I had to use a marker for, uh, for one of my books here, I had to pick, pull out the, uh, a list of uh, Benedictine values that are present in this institution. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting that without our knowing it, but then I have been formed so deeply in this institution that they very much, they will be very, very familiar uh, to those of you who are part of St. John's. But, so a Catholics formed in, in, in and living out of adult faith, first of all, ground themselves in prayer and a lifetime of study. You know, the Constitution on the liturgy talks about the, the liturgy as source and summit of Christian life. It is, the, it is from that that all prayer flows. But without prayer, we, are, we, we, we too easily can disconnect. We can create agenda that are disconnected. All of a sudden, we find that what God thinks just happens to be by accident what we think. And that prayer, discerning prayer, helps us to stay in touch uh, with, the, with the foundations of who we are and who we are called to be. And the other is that when you, when you, when you look at the, the, these two documents on the laity, um, they both recognize that as, as foundational as formation as children are in the faith, and we pour a lot of energy into forming children and youth, it is insufficient for a life over a lifetime. It's insufficient. It doesn't mean that what we learn from our parents and we learn from our early teachers is not important. Uh, but the study of scripture and tradition over the course of our life deepens what we know. Asking questions, uh, listening to different uh, perspectives, seeking uh, counsel from the elders expands our understanding of the mission to which we are called, not necessarily the one we prefer to follow. And that's what a lifetime of study does, of, any, uh, of, of helping us to continue to expand wider and wider. It is like like standing before the mystery of God, which we will never, will never penetrate, but that somehow, that's at least how I was formed theologically, is that we keep at it because we, we stand before the mystery and it, it becomes, uh, it, it reveals itself in small ways, but it, it's not, it does not come to us in a nice, neatly packaged theological statement. So, prayer and a lifetime of study. The second is that an adult Catholic practices radical hospitality. Uh, this this uh, quote from the uh, uh, Christi Fidelis Leitch, he said it so well, a member of the lay faithful can never remain in isolation from the community, but must live in continual interaction with others with a lively sense of fellowship, rejoicing in an equal dignity and common commitment to bring to fruition the immense treasures that uh, each has inherited. So it is the, the, the radicalness is at probably a, a number of levels. It is, it is about uh, seeing Christ in the other. It is about being able to welcome others who do not share our perspective. I think it is far easier to be kind to the poor, down and out person um, who doesn't have a friend in the world. It is much harder to welcome the person who does not share my political views. That's actually a confession. I work very hard at that, of saying, oh, okay, 
I've now discovered what you think about this. Um, I don't know if we can be in the same room. My oldest brother and I, about three years ago, it, it became very clear, but something he sent out to his, to the rest of us, there are six of us, uh, show, revealed, you know, it was a little clipping that he sent us that the poor are poor because they're lazy. So I wrote him a, what I believe is a scorching response that his parents did not raise him to think that, and it goes on and on and on, and my wife made me uh, reduce it from three single-spaced pages to one page. Um, but I had to work really hard, and then I sent off this letter, and he sent one back saying that, that we would never speak together in, a, in this lifetime, you know, and then guilt and shame took over because what was I doing? What was I doing? You know, we don't share the same policy decisions, but as we worked ourselves back to uh, brotherhood, uh, what we discovered is that we have some common values. We have different ways in which we interpret them uh, just between you and me. He is wrong. Um, <laughs> but the radicalness is of that. But it, so it's at that level. It is about being able to widen the embrace and to welcome others. And you, we know that within the, in uh, most any parish that I've been in, that is uh, one of the driving uh, forces of trying to figure out how to do that in this age. But it's also about this notion of cultivating relationship. That radical hospitality, if, people, if we in fact are going to do anything in transforming the world, it is about the ability of bringing people together, of connecting people, of in a sense mediating relationships, and that's radicalness. There's a more that, you know, there's, a, there's just a, a tendency to be pulling away into groups of, of where we all think the same way, act the same way, and come to the same conclusions. And the, uh, from a theological point of view and from a missionary point of view, we are not going to preach a, a message of transformation when there is that sort of fracturing that we contribute to. Right. So, radical hospitality. Uh, the third is this idea of, of adults contributing to the community out of spirit of generosity. And it's, it's here because stewardship is, is so prime, but it's stewardship in the broadest sense, both in terms of how we contribute to the well-being of the, of the, of the church, uh, sustaining that, but it is also a stewardship for communities, the nation, and the world. It's about being attentive to the common good. It's about being mindful of our responsibility for each other's well-being deeply embedded in the notion of the common good. Um, it is about being attentive to the environment and the use and distribution of resources. The fourth point is that adult uh, Catholics champion mutual respect and reconciliation. For me, this means uh, em embracing, uh, the, the embracing the practice, the modeling, the encouraging of behaviors that build unity, foster understanding, uh, promote civil conversation, and diffuse hostilities. Um, as disciples of Christ, we do life differently because the respect for persons governs how we argue about a position, an idea, a policy, how, we're, how we are going to live together. This, this, uh, this fourth one about championing mutual respect and reconciliation, and I think it's about, goes up to one about uh, stewardship as well, contributing out of a spirit of generosity. It's, it, I was trying to think of, of examples of this, and um, I couldn't help but to think about um, the number of Catholics that are in Congress. And we could have an interesting discussion about uh, that body of women and men. But, you know, there are, I, th I forgot, I was going to look at the numbers. I think something, something like 200 or so Catholics. Now, if, if, they were, if, they, if they were disciples of Christ, as Vic would like them to be disciples of Christ, if, in fact, they were governed about, if they, were, if they, were, uh, if they thought about the t two things, how do we steward in the midst of all the different ways in which we poli develop policies around that? But this, this fourth one about mutual respect and reconciliation, the vilification that occurs in public life um, is increasingly disturbing. And the fact that this group of very intelligent, well-meaning, I believe, committed uh, people in Washington cannot have a conversation 
um, in which they can get beyond a sort of an adolescent position on certain issues, a bit of a judgment in that, um, is, is, uh, it d does, not, does not serve the larger community. And um, then I, then, you know, so that was, that's, the, that's the global. And then I think about uh, uh, life here in the School of Theology in ways in which um, I have failed and which we have failed as a group to do some of the same things, to have that sense of mutual respect. We do things differently. We have disagreements. We have uh, sharp disagreements, but we deal with those differently because somehow we are convicted that being a disciple of Christ calls us into a new way of relationship. That ability, uh, I, it seems to me, is an adult ability. It is not about being petulant, it's not about being petty, but it is mustering up the courage and the perspective that says we, we can move from the person to the issue. There's a very interesting article, just a quick sidebar in the New York Times today, is a study that shows that um, uh, in, in, if you can in, introduce an ad hominem um, attack, in, a, in a opposing a, a position, that it has a significant effect on how people think about that position, and it's always negative. So that if I can convince you that the abbot um, is a bad person, and he's advocating something here at the university, and we can get a campaign that shows that he is not someone that we can trust, that he is a Muslim and was born uh, in Kenya, uh, that people's attitude towards the issue that he is trying to promote will change to the negative. So it seems to me that the responsibility is, in fact, for us, if we are convicted of our faith, if we are disciples, if we accept the responsibility that with baptism we are called as missionaries, somehow grappling with that is not just for those who like that sort of thing. I'm conflict adverse, but I, there's something working on this that has gnawed at me that I can't just say, oh, I don't like conflict and so I will avoid it, but it's more than just avoiding it. It is somehow, if, if relationship is at the basis of how we pre prepare a place for the gospel to be preached, then this uh, cultivating mutual respect and seeking reconciliation uh, cannot be avoided. And then finally, the final, this final mark is adult Catholics cultivate a zeal for justice. I was uh, doing a, a, par a, a excellent parish retreat about a month ago in Tucson for a, a friend of mine who's just taken over a par parish there and was using these five uh, characteristics. And um, the uh, parish administrator came up to me and said, gently, uh, we would prefer if you don't talk about social justice here. Because um, uh, she, she, she wasn't saying this for herself. She's saying that there are people here who just cannot stand the word. And I said, well, what about Matthew 28? Can I talk about Matthew 28? And she said, oh, yeah. That's, you know, she said they're generous. Um, but see, the, for them, social justice means uh, having no border control. Now, so the only reason I tell that story is that, uh, you know, I have been formed from my childhood in this sense that to be a Catholic is to seek justice. It is just my parents talked about it, my parents modeled it, and it has been part of my Catholic formation forever. And then I came here and uh, the seal was made. Uh, but it is being able to grapple with the issue of justice and not confusing that with policy. And that's what I, th I think happens, is that people get lost in policy decisions and therefore we no longer have to talk about justice. And so it's the adult part of that, again, it's like, it's, it's like cultivating uh, a, a, a mutual respect is that we have to be able to stretch beyond political affiliations, status of life, personal preferences and biases to integrate what we believe Jesus would in fact do in the actions we take or support. And you, again, if you think about the animosity when we talk about 
uh, we talk about immigrants, we talk about gun control, when we talk about taxes, it is being able to separate out the arguments, the legitimate arguments about policy and approaches from the fundamental value uh, object, uh, um, objectives about what this means in terms of the common good. Now, these five aspects that, that we work with and that um, I am now working with as I think about uh, adult, adult Catholics are clearly interdependent. That, you know, talk about them, you talk about them one by one. But um, zeal for justice for this parish that I just was at uh, is going to depend on prayer and a lifetime of study. They are not going to be get, get over. I mean, I, I think that it's okay to say, well, we'll talk, you know, we'll talk around the use of the term social justice when it is at the heart of who we are as Catholics. It should be disturbing to us that the research over the last 20 years show a, a, a notable decline in the number of people who say that to be a Catholic, you have to support the church's social teachings. There's been a decline, first time in surveying uh, Catholics that, that that's been there. And so um, just to talk about zeal for justice or, or to puff ourselves up and say, tisk tisk, aren't those people something, is it rather is about a call that we must immerse ourselves in prayer because we are not going to be able to uh, manage across these differences that we have in terms of policy. Um, and then we, we, do, we, need to, we need to do the study. In a similar way, um, championing mutual respect and reconciliation breathes life into this into radical hospitality. We're not going to have, we're not going to be able to build relationships unless we are working at uh, this championing of mutual respect. So, you know, whether we talk about them one by one or we see them in interaction, and it's probably the one visual I should have had. I'm not a PowerPoint person, and I, I am, I, I'm, I'm criticized by the young for not doing, uh, using PowerPoint more. Uh, but they are, they're, they're, inter, they, they're inter, interdependent. No matter how we look at them, they are very strong meat. Uh, they are the diet of adults, I believe. People are going to be adult uh, uh, Christians. They're going to have to struggle with them. Um, but they pose challenges. and, and um, I'll talk about it. I, have, I had a long list. I spared you. I decided that I would uh, force myself. I was in getting into fives, and I thought I would go to end up with the Trinitarian three. Um, but they're, they're, they're helpful groupings for me. The first is the most obvious, and is that uh, the, this, these d descriptors of what it means to be an adult uh, a Catholic are very hard work. And it's easier, I can understand it, it's easier to have a class of people who do heavy lifting. So those who are so clergy, religious, lay ecclesial ministers, and then a relatively, uh, percentage-wise, a relatively small body of the baptized um, who um, do this, and we are, uh, we are content to say, that's great. I'm glad someone can do it because it's hard work. And somehow, you know, being in a monastery makes this stuff all much easier, right? makes it much easier. Being, yeah, you know, being, a, being a priest or being a lay quasi minister makes it a lot easier. But, um, and, and, you know, so you have that, so it's hard. And it's very messy um, to try to think about discipleship and life in the world. There are people who are very content to have a wall, an impenetrable wall between um, just for the sake of the description, the sake of the uh, uh, idea, between Sunday and the rest of the rest of the week, it's messy to think about how one is a disciple in one's work. I've got a 38-year-old daughter, um, uh, has a difficult relationship with the church. But I was talking about this speech, and I was talking about this, you know, that at the Travelers Company in St. Paul, where she's a project mon uh, manager that she needs to be mindful of those values and virtues in which she has been raised and to, and to witness them in the workplace. And I know that she's a good person and that she's value driven, but, you know, she, and she loves me dearly, but she looked at me as though I was from Mars because it's very countercultural to think that. The image that we have are people who at the water cooler say, or say, have you taken Jesus as your personal savior? There are a wide variety of ways of living out that discipleship. 
Um, but you have to do it consciously, you have to do it actively, you have to do it thoughtfully, you have to do it attentively. And so it's very hard work. And we think that in an increasingly secular society, we can't do that. And I think it's be precisely because of the hard work that we loop back to this, the, uh, as one of the, doc one of the quotes I gave you uh, earlier, is the indispensability of the community. I can't figure out how to do this by myself. I cannot sustain the enthusiasm and the effort and the attentiveness by myself. And so that if, in fact, it's going to happen, it is about bringing people together and fostering the, the sorts of conversations that help people find ways to articulate it, to describe it, uh, so that it works within their world. So that's, that's, I think that's one of, the, one of the, the, the persistent challenges. The second is that although we have made some strides in adult faith formation, we continue to lack a structure, a history, and a culture where it is, in a sense, indispensable. There has never been a tradition of adult Sunday school for Catholics that's ever taken hold. So, you know, and, and, and there are parishes that are doing some things, but I've listened to a lot of parish ministers who pour a lot of energy into creativity for the 10 or 15 percent of these very large parishes who turn out for it. So, let me, let me, let me move to my area, which is uh, teaching and learning, and talk about this in terms of, in terms of pedagogy. Again, you know, these are my observations. There is a tendency uh, among uh, church insiders to believe that having a well-crafted answer does not require knowing what the question is. <laughs> I raise my children. I have two children, wonderful people. Um, but I know, you know that, that I would give them far more information because I believed as a parent panicked about sending them out into the world um, that if I just gave them a whole bunch of information, that somehow it would shape what was going to happen to them. Um, I ha uh, my, uh, Jeff Castor, who directs our youth and, ministry pro uh, youth and ministry theology program here at St. John's, has talked about the move of the, uh, the bishops to uh, require a more formal catechism, it's the sort of thing that I had uh, growing up in Langley, Wisconsin, uh, 60 years ago. Um, fearful that the approach that really tries to form them as disciples that leads them into um, well-crafted answers, uh, they're, they're worried that that, won't, that will, won't happen. But here's what we know, here are some, some little factoids that, that influence my concern about the sort of the pedagogy of adult formation, form, formation. One is that we do know a lot about how they learn. We know, for instance, that, in, that to a large degree, what we rec remember, what we recall, what, we, what we goes into the neural network connects to what we already know. And so for me to give the answer before I understand how you're thinking about something means I don't know whether or not I'm able to relate it to some, uh, to help you relate it to some, to that sort of in uh, sense of consciousness in, in the way that you interpret it, right? So that, that, that's, I think that, that's, that's, that's been very helpful for me in my work with adult groups is the time that I spend trying to listen to them um, helps me to know what I can do to position what we need to learn in a way that connects um, and so that it expands the network. It's not just to confirm what they know, but it's to expand, and the network expands um, uh, by building on uh, the base that's there. The second is that <clears throat> there's not a homogeneous group called adults, adult Catholics. There are... Um, in educational research now, and I, I read dissertations, um, there are just a wide range of learning styles, approaches to learning uh, that affect how people pay attention and how they take things in. A lot of, I don't know how many people here, but generally you can say about a third of a group really likes to listen to a well-prepared with PowerPoint presentation. They, they learn a great deal with a well-prepared lecture. Others really can do that as long as they have the visuals. 
And that PowerPoint is not about entertainment. It's what we've learned is that sometimes the, the visualization, whether you use, you're using words or you're using some mapping process, really helps people begin to say, I now see what you mean. Are there people who need to be engaged with it, people who need some sort of artistic, uh, artistic link, a story, uh, some people who, who can read a poem and they, all of a sudden they say, now I know what you're talking about. Right? So we have all this variability that are involved with that. We also are dealing with people who are at very different stages of life. They're adults. They also bring with them a wide range of life experiences that, formula, that forms and impacts how they think about God, how they think about religion, how they think about the spiritual, the spiritual quest and the spiritual journey. And developmentally, what we, what we know now, after uh, about uh, 25 to 30 years of research, is that there are, there's a variety of stages that one goes through, developing cognitively, um, in terms of moral, moral development, uh, religious development, and that, we are, that people are not all at the same place at the same time. Where that becomes uh, uh, challenging, it seems to me, to those who are responsible for uh, forming people um, in the faith is the, the whole area of critical thinking. And it, and, 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 it is about the ability to think, and it's about the ability to think about your one's thinking. But it is helping people, being under, understanding how people react to, to things like concepts, assumptions, inferences, points of view. That there are people, you may have worked with them, you may know them, um, for whom they are totally unaware of the assumptions of their conclusions. That, you know, in the, in the, the issue with my oldest brother, it was pretty clear to me that um, he was not aware of his assumption, of the assumptions and the positions that he was taking about his view of the poor. But it's also the ability to assess evidence. And that study that the report of the New York Times is about that, about um, the accuracy of evidence, the clarity, the precision, the logic of it. It is amazing to me the number of people who believe that the truth is in the internet. My wife has two friends, very good friends. They had two very good friends who no longer speak to them because they read they, their opinions of Barack Obama are taken from the blogs. And they believe that those blogs are true. And when my wife's friends, both of them independently, try to say, well, that may, they, they may not be giving you the fullness of truth. I don't think they probably use that word. Um, these friends uh, simply could not tolerate that. They had no ability to assess the evidence. And so when we think about forming people in the faith, and we talk about this lifetime of study, what we are dealing with are people who may not be ready, who have a very uncritical sense of what they, what the, what they believe and actually what they believe even once, once they read it or that they hear it. I say all this because um, I am very sympathetic to preachers who have to stand before a congregation in which you have an immense amount of diversity. I am very sympathetic and feel that the primary position after the pastor, uh, uh, I will say this because Father Anthony is not here, he's not the director of liturgy, but it is the director of faith formation, of trying to figure out how, in fact, we are going to form people who are at so, different, so many different places. It is, uh, it is helpful, or it's hopeful for me, uh, about the intrigue that's given towards young adults using the web and all the social media uh, to try to connect with them, you know, uh, meeting them at bars. Uh, we did that in my era, but it wasn't to uh, talk about the gospel. Um, but it, that's, that same sort of creativity needs to be done with, um, with, with all adults. And it, and, it, and it seems to me that from a pedagogical point of view, it really begins with people who are able to foster um, uh, solid conversations and are able to listen deeply. 
because it's in the conversation. Uh, one of the things, again, Jeff Castor has discovered young, with young people, and he talks about it so eloquent, is that he says that when you talk seriously about, with young people about the questions they have, they are simply eloquent. They are thinking very serious thoughts, and that youth ministry programs that entertain the youngsters, that keep them happy and engaged because uh, you know, uh, a busy youngster um, uh, it will, be, will be free of sin and temptation, evidently, is the, is the theory. Uh, Jeff said you, you really need to create environments in which they can respond from their hearts with the questions that they have at 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age. And in, in a similar way, I have been, or I've worked with, with very skillful ministers. Um, who carry on those sorts of congregation, uh, those kind of sort of conversations in their parish before they do any programming, to try to hear how people are thinking, what are they thinking about, what are the issues that are pressing upon them. It's not that ministers are, should not be expert in theology and they should not have a message that they want uh, to convey, but again, that message will be heard most clearly and most brilliantly when it matches up with what the questions are that are pressing down upon people, that keep them awake at night, whether it's in raising their children or maintaining their relationships or working in the world or dealing with political decisions that they have to make, whatever it is, and being able to make a, a bridge between what people are conversing about and how that has, this, the, how the, 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 the light and the witness of the gospel speaks to that and speaks to them in that situation. So. Um, I don't have an easy answer, but I do know that simply doing more catechesis by heaping on more information will not have the cumulative impact that we want. It will not change hearts and minds. It won't do it. I, it, it, it is important and there's a place for it, but there is there's a necessity, as a fellow from a parish in Minneapolis told me recently, he said, I, I expect to be preached to as an adult. I don't expect to be scolded. I don't expect people to, to use simplistic uh, um, stories or vocabulary. I expect to be treated as adult because I have adult questions, adult concerns, and adult worries, and how those all fit together with my relationship with God are critical to me. And that, so that sort of conversing and listening is important. So that's the second, this pedagogical area. The third implication, if we're really serious about this, is, are the consequences of people actually taking seriously these five markers. Okay, first of all, there's going to be, and we're, we see it of course all the time, loss of docility, of docility and the rise uh, of a demand for dialogue. The documents themselves say very interesting that a lot, especially in Christe Fidelis Leici, that it is that pastoral leaders um, and their clergy uh, uh, the pastoral leaders and their congregations can, through conversation, I wish I, I should have it here, through conversation can, uh, you know, address the, the practical needs of doing what they're saying here. That there is a place for that, um, but um, people are not going to be docile. I, you know, I, I, my memory of growing up in, in my home is that I, my parents were all very docile, um, uh, when they were with the priest, but I, you know, upstairs in this old house, I could hear them talking, and I mean, they were as adults talking about, well, that just didn't make sense. Did you listen to what he said? That did not make sense. But now people don't do that in the kitchen. Uh, they do that. They, they, they do that in, at public meetings. So as we engage people, if we're serious about that, and they're growing in their faith, they're becoming, you know, they're asking questions, they're reading the documents, they're processing those. Um, there's a different conversation. A level of conversation that's going to emerge. And that means that there's going to be disagreement and dissent in search of understanding. And sometimes when I hear, listen to ministers talk about that, they panic. Somebody will come in and say, I just, you know, I just don't believe in the resurrection of Christ anymore. And there's a, there's a, there's a sense that this soul is going to be lost forever. And uh, people's uh, initial disagreement about uh, something, about a teaching, you know, most of the time it's going to be around practical pastoral practices, um, it, it, that is part of a journey, and it is being able to walk with people and to be patient enough to be able to listen uh, through to the end of what really is going on and to ask a lot of questions. 
what's, what, is, what, what happens, you know, we, what we know about uh, religious uh, discussions is that there's a, a centripetal force to them. For, we watch it, we can watch it worldwide, we can watch it across uh, religious groups is that there is this pull. As people start talking about it, there is the tendency to want to pull away and to, you know, to go off in, into our camps or into our individual, individual positions. And what we need to, and that's going to happen, that's going to happen, is if we ask people to join the conversation as adults, that centripetal force is going to be present. The centrifugal uh, mandate, however, is to seek unity. And the only response I have to that, it seems to me, is that all level, leadership at all levels uh, need, uh, need, uh, uh, needs to be committed to this idea of conversation and deep listening. And it's not just bishops and popes and those high councils, and it's not just clergy. We just like to kick them around all the time. I have seen some really uh, distancing things done by lay quasi ministers and parish councils. A lot of my work has been going in and and working with parish councils. And um, uh, the way that they handle disagreement is as top-down as our most uh, exaggerated stories of clerical authoritarianism. You shall do this. I am the director of liturgy. You will do it this way. And will not have a clue about why people have asked whether that they could have the, the theme from Lion King for their wedding. Um, so, the, so you know, the, it is not that we're going to we're going to have a, a you know people people will stray. Some people will, but most of the time, people are just asking questions. They are curious. They want to know. They are trying to put together what the church teaches with what their experience tells them, and we can contribute to that centripetal experience, or motivated by this, this desire to seek unity is to engage people at a level that uh, keeps them con connected and in touch. I have found it when I have been called into a troubled parish, um, and as I have already told you, I'm conflict adverse, so it's amazing that I do this work. But what I have found is that nothing helps as much as doing some sustained lexio on uh, uh, texts from, uh, from, from the writings of Paul. There is something uh, uh, beautiful and eloquent and compelling about these texts that help connect people's immediate experience about what we're going to do about this with the wider experience of how are we going to be faithful to the mission that we've, we've been given. So I'm going to close uh, with this, this very brief uh, passage from, that I think illustrates that sort of grounding uh, vision of who we are uh, from uh, uh, Ephesians 4. So I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one hope, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And it's embracing that sort of vision that makes the challenge, it seems to me, of raising up these marks of being adult, uh, adult Catholic, uh, so hopeful and so promising, even if it is complex. Thank you. I think we had just an hour, and I don't, right? And, but if there is a compelling question that you think that I could possibly say more. I will just tell you this. I thought I had about 30 minutes of tre uh, material tonight, and so there we go. I uh, never trust your readings of this. Any observations or questions? Nimu. Thank you.
in faith formation and the mission of Christ for our time. I mean, uh, yeah. you have already said, but uh, the Bullet family has not yeah. appeared Sorry. in this, and that is very, very important, I suppose. And I'd be chastened by both of these documents because they really do talk about the, the you know, the uh, domestic church, the family as the, as the first of the fount. You mentioned that in a couple of large parishes, they had 10 to 15 percent of the people that were actively engaged in adult education or adult for formation. And the two parishes that I was in back in uh, southeast Texas, the one that the smaller one had, two, had at least 200 adults. That would have been 20 or 30 people in it. We, I mean, it never even, it never happened. The only reason that anyone would be interested in anything beyond what they learned as children, for the purpose of now teaching it to their children, was that they wanted to be a deacon, a priest, mm -hmm. or a sister. Those were the only reasons that anyone would ever want to do that. And it wasn't until I found the two Benedictine monks in Beaumont that I got with a group where that wasn't the case. They were actually interested in learning for learning. Yeah. But what in those large parishes that had the 10 to 15 percent, how did that happen? I mean, how did they even, how did they get even that? <laughs> Um, well, you know, I, I, I really can't answer that. I mean, part of it is, you know, they, they, they're getting, people are getting more and more creative about doing that. But it's the 10 or 15 people, percent that tend to respond to everything. You know, and so it's, um, you know, some of it is, some of it, some people, here's what ministers will say. Some of the small group work that we've done with uh, Renew, uh, Catholics Coming Home, I forgot what the name of that is, um, Bible study. There are some of those smaller environments are encouraging, you know, are, are cultivating that interest and curiosity. Um, but we, you know, we we don't we don't have a tradition of it. We don't have a, uh, a expectation of it. And what I've heard recently is that uh, people are afraid sometimes now to come because we're going to have a fight. Liberals will be against the conservatives, the the Pope people and the anti-Pope people. Um, that sort of factionalism, and they say, I have enough of that in politics, I have enough of that at work, I don't need to have it in the church. So it, it's, it, is, it is a cultural change that we are working towards. And that's, you know, that's why, you know, I think that when we, when someone says I'm just an adult faith formation person, I have to say, no, 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 you're not. I mean, you have a major job. Preaching a Sunday homily is not five minutes of funny stories about your Aunt Gertie, but it really is trying to figure out how do you light the fuse that um, inspires people to begin to think seriously about what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Um, I have not found any, any program that works to the degree that people hope it will work. There's not a programmatic response. It is about trying to engage people, and that's why this stuff with young adults is, is so interesting. It's trying to engage people in conversations from which will emerge the questions that then you can uh, say something about. Let's break now, because there's some people who, well, we, oh, Abel, not, no, no. not before himself speaks. Uh, yeah. but, but, but then we can have some coffee, and there's some uh, sweets back there. No, we'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back? Okay, yeah. But thanks very much for uh, allowing me to share my reflections with you. I appreciate it a great deal.